Six Flags. Now there's a fun place. Dare I say, the happiest place on earth. Uh, can't say that, but it is a happy place. I imagine most of you know about Six Flags, but in case you don't, it's the non-Disney version of Disneyland. Sort of. It's a theme park with rides, attractions, cartoon characters walking around, but instead of Mickey Mouse in the gang, it's Bugs Bunny in the gang. Around 2005, they had these commercials with Mr. Six dancing around to this catchy song. Enough of that. What I want to talk about today is the rise and fall and rise again of Six Flags. I'll get more into it later, but here's a few things that perfectly express what I'm talking about. First off, look at this. It's from one of their annual reports, and it says that if you invested $100 in Six Flags in December of 2004, it would have been a bad decision because it'd be mostly gone by 2009. You would have done significantly better investing in an S&P 500 index, or let's face it, almost anywhere else. But if you had invested that $100 in 2010, that would have been a terrific decision because you would have more than tripled your money in a few years, far better than that other index. Here's a chart showing their net income from the past 20 years. They were losing money every year without exception from 1999 to 2009 and then amazingly just switched to earning money every year after. It's really looking like something changed right around 2010 and that's because in 2009 they filed for bankruptcy and came back from it the following year. It meant new owners, new managers, and maybe most importantly, lower debt. By almost any key measure, they're back. So let's talk about what happened. In the late 1950s, this real estate developer named Angus Wynn got together with a few partners to buy 7,500 acres of land in Texas with the intention of turning it into an industrial area. Essentially construct a bunch of buildings, have various businesses move in, and make a ton of money in the process. The issue was they had spent all of their money in buying the land and had nothing left to pay for the buildings. Their big idea as to how to raise money was to open Six Flags. Now, I know that sounds completely random, and it sort of was, but it did make sense. They already had more than enough land to build it on, and plus, Disneyland had just opened a few years earlier. It was doing well and setting an example that they could follow, which they did. Over the next year, they took 212 acres of their land in Arlington, Texas, and spent $10 million, 3.5 million of it from Angus personally, to build this theme park. It was actually a theme, somewhat educational even. They called it Six Flags Over Texas referring to the six areas that have ruled over Texas. There were Spain, France, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, Confederate States of America, and finally the United States of America. I don't want to turn this into a whole history lesson, but the park was divided into six sections, each one with a theme from that area. So if you were ever wondering why it's called Six Flags, that's where it comes from. They obviously took big inspiration from Disneyland, but they did give people reason to visit their park instead. Obviously you have the cool themes relevant to Texas history, but then there's the convenience factor. It was easier for the residents of Texas to travel to Arlington as opposed to Anaheim, California. And also, the price. The initial admission price in 1961 to Six Flags Over Texas was $2.75 for an adult and $2.25 for a child. But that price was all-inclusive. It included all the rides and attractions. When Disneyland opened in 1955, the admission was only $1 for an adult, $0.50 for a child. But then 10 to 35 cents per attraction meant you were spending way more. According to an article from CNBC, it can cost you as much as $8.70 for an adult and $5.15 for each kid. So in general, Six Flags Over Texas would turn out to be a cheaper and more convenient alternative for millions of people. That's how they would promote themselves too. For these reasons, the park attracted over a million people in its first year, which was more than double their projections. Despite their unexpected success, they more or less stuck to their plan when they used the money that they made to build up their industrial area, and in 1966, five years after its grand opening, they sold it to Penn Central Corporation. They had a lot more money to put toward growing the business and opening new theme parks. They didn't waste any time either. The next year, in 1967, they opened the second ever Six Flags in Atlanta and logically called it Six Flags Over Georgia. It had the same concept and theme as the one in Texas, but of course applied to Georgia. By now, I should also mention, there was a lot more happening at these parks. They introduced the first log 
Plume Ride, the first steel roller coaster, and as a result of their investment in these innovations, they were able to charge more and were attracting more visitors. When Six Flags Over Georgia opened, they had over 1.2 million visitors in that first summer that were now paying $3.95 to get into the park. These first two theme parks were such a success that they spent the next decade or so opening more of them. In 1971, they opened Six Flags Over Mid-America in Eureka, Missouri. In 1975, they opened Astro World in Houston. In 1978, it was Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey. And in 1979, they bought Magic Mountain in Valencia, California. At this point, I think we can see their pattern. Opening, or in some cases, acquiring theme parks in different regions throughout the country and attracting local customers with innovative new rides, cool themes, and reasonable prices. All of that continued, but I want to switch my focus to the ownership of Six Flags because it starts getting crazy. As I said, it was started by Angus Wynn in 1961 and then sold to Penn Central in 1966. They held on to it for a while, building it to the six parks that I mentioned located across the country. Then, in 1982, Bally Manufacturing bought it for $147 million. It was under their control in 1984 when they added Six Flags Great America in Illinois and acquired the theme park rights to the Warner Brothers characters, which meant they could now legally have Bugs Bunny walking around the park. In 1987, Six Flags was then bought by a company called West Ray Capital for $617 million in a shaky leveraged buyout. To raise the money, they issued these high-risk bonds and took out a bunch of bank loans. Then in 1990, Time Warner bought 19.5% of Six Flags for, oddly enough, $19.5 million, and it seemed like such a great fit. Their involvement started six years earlier with that deal involving all those characters, and this was a way to take things one step further. I'm talking about stronger character integration, things like merchandising, and not to mention, this is just a huge company that can provide money and other resources, such as their television involvement that was used to promote the parks. Just one year later, there were more big changes. Two investment firms from New York pulled together $150 million to buy half of Six Flags, and Time Warner put up an additional $31 million to increase their ownership to half. In 1993, Time Warner then paid those investment firms $70 million for their half, and were now 100% owner of Six Flags. Flags. Bugs Bunny, Six Flags, the whole thing, they were finally all together under the same company. After this long line of transfers, it seems like this would be the end, but no, we have a few more to go. Just two years later, in 1995, Time Warner sold 51% of its share to an investment group led by Boston Ventures for $1 billion. Here's what the deal meant. Instead of being part of Time Warner, Six Flags was now its own company, 49% owned by Time Warner and 51% owned by Boston Ventures. Time Warner received $200 million in cash and effectively transferred $800 million in debt to the newly formed independent Six Flags. We have one more to go, but it's easily the biggest and most significant transfer of them all. In 1998, Premier bought Six Flags for $1.86 billion. Since I'm guessing you've never heard of Premier, you may be wondering where they came from and how they got $1.86 billion. Well, let me tell you about them. They started in the early 70s as a real estate company, but then in 1981, they bought this rundown amusement park in Oklahoma City called Frontier City. Their initial intention was to divide up the land, build a shopping center, but instead, they decided to invest some money into fixing up the park. The investment paid off, and by the late 80s, they had switched their focus from real estate to theme parks. They got together with all these private investors, had a couple of public stock offerings, took out some debt, and throughout the 1990s, used all of that money to acquire some other theme parks. By 1998, they had 13 of them and were ready to take on the huge acquisition of Six Flags. The deal added eight theme parks, three water parks, the rights to use those Warner Brother characters and DC characters such as Batman and Superman, and the rights to the name. Premier quickly started rebranding all of those various existing theme parks into Six Flags parks. In 2000, they changed their name to Six Flags, all while continuing to acquire more parks. For example, in 1999, they acquired the the largest theme park in Mexico. Now let me talk about all of the debt that's tied to this. Back to 1987, that weird leveraged buyout added a bunch of debt. 
Then in 1995, when they became their own company, Time Warner effectively pushed $800 million of their debt into it. That opportunity to reduce their debt was actually a big reason they got rid of it. When Premier bought it in 1998, they received $890 million in debt from Six Flags and added more in the process, on top of some debt that they had built up from their previous acquisitions. And then, as if that wasn't enough, instead of working to pay off that debt, they actually added to it so they can continue acquiring other theme parks. That's just irresponsible. I'm just saying, isn't Six Flags enough? At the point where you spent almost $2 billion buying it after buying a dozen other theme parks over the past decade, all resulting in this crushing debt? Stop buying theme parks, <laughs> you've bought enough. Here's a graph showing Premier's long-term debt over this time. It clearly just shot up with the Six Flags acquisition in 1998 and stayed in that range up until the bankruptcy. The reason they weren't paying it off is, well, as I said, they were still buying theme parks for the next few years, finally started selling some around 2004, but look at this interest expense. They were paying around $200 million a year in interest. I think it's safe to say that's why they never made any money. So in 2009, here we have a company with $2 billion in debt, paying $200 million in interest each year that never makes any money. I would have to say those are pretty big factors in why that stock price dropped. Now, I usually try to tell a story by looking at revenue, but it really doesn't work here. There were so many parks being bought and sold that it makes their sales and attendance rise and fall from year to year, but none of it really reflects the state of the company. They did have trouble attracting people to their parks at various times. I've seen it blamed on the weather, economic issues, exchange rates. I guess you can look deeper into some of those, but I don't think that's where the story is here. These people at Premier created a situation where sales needed to be unreasonably high to make any profit. And looking at their mentality and what they did with their existing funds over that time, I don't think it would have went toward lowering that debt anyway. I don't think they would have stopped until they actually owned Disneyland. And Come on, let me know in the comments. Do you agree with everything I just said? I know this video had more of a financial focus, but I think that was appropriate. Maybe as a customer, you have some other explanations for the rise and fall and rise again. Maybe it was the rides that got worse or better, the attractions. There was always this debate on whether they should be focusing on teenagers or the whole family. Could be something involving that. Did Mr. Six have something to do with it? I don't know, <laughs> I just like that guy. So any thoughts about it, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.